impact on supply chain management in the post lockdown environment? Welcome all to you. Oh, I see some people typing. Right, so it's nine o'clock, so let's get started. So supply chain management, this has become very important. So what are we going to cover today in this one hour presentation? So we're going to look at what is supply chain management. There's an awful lot said in the press at the moment about supply chain management. We're going to look at what's impacting on today's events and trends on supply chain management. And then we'll have a look at what opportunities there are for supply chain management in the supply chain environment post lockdown and so of course we'll have to talk about risk and if time gets uh, available we'll also have a little bit of a chat about supply chain management so good morning to you all so whenever i have one of these presentations i always think what's in it for you so i'd, I'd like you to just think about these and you might want to jot some notes you may even have a, an action plan so you know what are you trying to get out of today's webinar how could you apply this we learning in your day-to-day -day? because I always think what we learn in the training environment is no good until we can actually use that learning out into the real world to make a difference how will I have know that I've used it so hopefully you'll get better at your supply chain management. And is there anyone that you need to share this learning with as in your business environment, back in the workplace? And again, you might also, it might prompt some ideas on how you can further develop your action plan. So that might be additional training areas where you might need to go and look at or maybe even take action that you hadn't thought of before. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes, just to, a uh, couple of moments just to take, um, make some notes there. So I suppose the first thing we need to say is what is supply chain management? We all talk about it as though we know what it is. And so here's a definition that I found. It's the design, planning, execution, and monitoring and control of the supply chain activities. And the idea is we're trying to create net value because we're in the business environment. And so we want to build net value. We want to build competitive infrastructure and use worldwide logistics. And this is a really key point synchronizing supply with demand we need both we need to we need that source of demand and we need to be able to supply to meet that demand and sometimes this is where i have um sometimes with politicians say you talk about the supply part but they don't talk about what is the demand they're trying to meet have they met all of that demand so it's important in many of today's organization it's a third pillar. Yes, we have our sales and marketing people representing demand. We have the finance people because we're trying to make a profit. And the other part of that triad, the other part of that tripod is supply chain management. Being that's all the resources we use to meet that demand, but in a profitable way. So you can see the supply chain decisions determine how the business is organized, how information flows, flow around the organization, trying to understand that demand and what we do to meet that demand. And also looks at how products and services are sourced and made because supply chain management is not just about products, it can also be about services. In one of my roles, I'm in um, a number of government organizations and we talk about supply chain management even for things like adult social services and children's social services. There is a supply chain and we need to take account of that supply chain because if we don't, we can't meet that demand. And financials, and there's an interesting one, supply chain management, it's the largest cost of most in most organizations. And that's an important one to take hold of. So supply chain management, it gives us a way of understanding our supply chains and how we can marshal our resources 
to meet that demand. Now here's some um, in in a bit of humour coming in. One of my colleagues he de designed this. He say at the start of the year, no one was right. Not many people were worried about supply chains. Just the people in supply chain management. And so we're seeing because of the coronavirus, is a his coffee consumption is still the same. His car, his car was very important back in January and February, and now as we've gone through the lockdown, he's been staying at home. So he's hardly having to drive. Internet's been useful because that's how we stay in contact. Or maybe we've been using it for entertainment, watching movies on Netflix. Or maybe playing games on the internet with people in all sorts of parts of the world. Uh, this person here, he used to shave every day, but now he's not shaving now. He's maybe drinking a little bit more, which is probably not a good thing. But there he's supply chains. Supply chains weren't important, as important back in January and February. And now... It's the number one thing that most people are talking about. How do our supply chains meet the environment that we're in at the moment? So that's just a, a light-hearted way of looking at it. So we talk about a supply chain. What is that supply chain? So if we think about a supply chain, it's all of those processes right back to the primary producer. So the primary producers, they're people who mine things. So it could be iron ore, um, it could be drilling for oil, coal. It could also be farmers who are growing things or fishermen who are catching things. And so, they catch, you know, so we have these um, primary products, primary produce, and we then go through various stages of manufacturing. So for example, if we talk about iron ore, iron ore is mined maybe in a place like Australia, and then it ships maybe to China, and they make it into iron and then further on someone else might make it into steel and someone else might take that steel and make it into sheet plates and eventually it might end up in things like washing machines so it's gone through a lot of different stages now an important thing also is part of that is also the transport so you know it's gone from maybe australia up to china china maybe to europe and then europe through different parts of europe before it finally gets to um the distribution chain but eventually it gets out to the consumer. And I'll put the consumer here, not at the end of the supply chain, but at the heart of the supply chain. Because the customer is the heart of the supply chain. And the other thing, if you look here, I've got in two arrows down the bottom there. I've got push and pull. I mean, some people look at supply chains and say, it's a matter of pushing product through the supply chain. And other people say, no, actually we have to have material pulled through the supply chain by the customer, that customer demand at the heart of the supply chain. And that's part of what supply chain management is, trying to link all of those processes right from the consumer all the way to that primary producer. And if you think about it, that primary producer is also at the end of another supply chain. So in oil exploration, we talk about a production supply chain, but we also talk about an exploration supply chain. So that the end of one is the start of another one. So what are some of the trends that are impacting on supply chains? And I suppose one of the big ones is the rise of the power of the customers. Customers becoming much more um, wanting to, needing more quality. So they determine the marketplace. They need quality is in order to qualify. We talk about order to qualify as an order winners. Maybe 20 years ago, quality was an order winner. These days, it's an order quality. Without that quality, it's an order qualifier. Without that quality, you're not a valid contender in the market. People will soon go away from products with poor quality. And also, they will share their experiences of poor quality. Because of the internet, they can put out their, their um, feedback on that. They might have a Twitter, or they might post it on Facebook, or you even have sites such as TripAdvisor where people are able to talk about their experiences, talk about their good as well as their poor experiences. Price, it's all determined by the value to the customer. How good does that product meet the customer's requirements? How much utility? That's the um, economic term that we talk about. Fulfillment. So people want things quickly. And this is where things, places, platforms like Amazon, 
I mean, when Amazon first came out 20 years ago, doesn't seem that long ago, does it? 15 years ago, there used to be about a two day or three day wait. These days, Amazon can supply you the same day, maybe even the same morning or the same afternoon. And that's the way they've configured their supply chain to make that. It will also be self-service. Again, if you think about Amazon and those online shopping platforms, very much the people just can go through, they can see the stocks, and they can select the product themselves and get it as soon as possible. But also sometimes people want products customized. So you might find this with cars. People want a, a, a car in their own unique configuration. And then again, this is the way the car supply chains be configured so that they can make a car different from everyone else's car, but still in that high volume, high quality environment. And as again, service instantaneous, so we talked about that, flawlessly executed and highly responsive. And I suppose if you think about it, if we thought, look at what happened during this coronavirus, maybe even pre-lockdown, a lot of people were panic buying. And they were panic buying all sorts of interesting things like toilet paper, pasta, yeast, flour. And people said, oh, this is terrible. But the supply chains, they were able to look at that. And because they were responsive, they were able to meet that sudden increase in demand very quickly. And so there was very little out of stocks. The stocks were being resupplied every day. And people were still panic by them. And eventually they thought, oh, we don't need to panic buy because the supply chains are meeting their demand. Globalization. Uh, of course, with the internet and better communications, but also the way um, the aircraft industry and the other um, infrastructure developments, we can now source products around the world. So it's a global supply chain. So again, if we think about China, and China has been very clever here, they've got this One Belt, One Road initiative where they're trying to improve their infrastructure, their communications infrastructure their transport infrastructure. And in fact, that stretches all the way into Europe. A couple of years ago, they even started a train service, direct train service from the UK to China. And so now we can get things from the UK, goods from China and the other way. So it's a bit more expensive than sea freight, of course, but it's much cheaper than air freight and it's sort of in that middle ground. So it gives more choices. <coughs> <coughs> Increased competition, again, of course, it's a global market. People are getting products from around the globe. And so rather than you're just competing with someone in the next town or the next state, you're competing with people in the far-flung parts of the world. So there's also a global demand for goods and services. And you might also be supplying your goods and services globally. And so supply chains are a great way of improving that marketing system. There's some other interesting ones there coming down into outsourcing of the channel structure. People are looking at what is their core competency? In other words, what do we do best? And then we concentrate on that. We don't try and do everything. So for example, I work for an aerospace industry and they've got a warehouse on their site. So they own the warehouse. They own all the materials in the warehouse, but they don't run the warehouse, they bring in a contractor to actually run the contractor because they to run, run the warehouse because they say our expertise is building airplanes, not in running warehouses. So this is what people do, and they say, what is it that we do best, and then get our suppliers to do those other parts. And in fact, their suppliers may have better knowledge. So we talk about using their suppliers as a, a an area of knowledge to help you make better products. And the other thing is also with supply chains, we talk about building linkages with our key suppliers because we don't want to just use them once and then forget them. No, we want to work with those suppliers in building resilient supply chains. And as part of that, we want to use their knowledge because if, if we can use their knowledge, we'll have better products, we'll sell more, which means we'll buy more of their product. And so it's a win-win. So yes, there's also a heavy pressure on costs and profits. As I said, focus on internal competencies. And also, can we explore new markets without incurring the cost?
So we're using operations management, and so there's a number of organizations around the world who are improving the knowledge, the body of knowledge on supply chain management and helping people to come up with the core competencies. And we look at things like customer value and superior service, and customer service is an important point, part of it. I think when I first started in business many years ago, back in the 80s, um, customer service was not as well looked after then and in poor quality was really a, a big problem so this is where we had a lot of the, the total quality management um, programs that came up around that time the next one there synchronizing sourcing requirements with supplier capabilities so again it's working with our suppliers getting them to understand what our, our demand will be and helping to talk with our suppliers so that they can better supply with us so again it's this communication but also on the supply side is helping the customers to understand what our suppliers like too and as a, a consumer now you can have a lot of visibility into some of your organization some of the places you might be shopping at you can see what their inventory levels are like maybe even from your mobile phone and you know that that's a great way to stop wasted journey. So rather than saying I'll go down here and then be frustrated when they don't have it, you can look it up beforehand and say, I wonder if they've got that product before we even set off. So again, using cross-channel collaborative partnerships. So you might be collaborating with people like with your suppliers. You might be collaborating with your logistics providers, third-party logistics, fourth-party logistics provider, and we have this idea of Social supply chain optimization. So I've talked a little bit about information technology. <coughs> Pardon me. Information technologies. I mean, information technologies have been improving. Again, if I go back to the dim dark days when I first started, we didn't have computers. All the information was handwritten on cards. And that was very error prone because you know it was very easy to make a manual um, arithmetic error. It still is, but hopefully with computers, they do that less. And because that's what computers are good in, they're good at doing lots of multiple calculations flawlessly. But also we can get that information around the globe. So I'm talking to you from the UK and you could be anywhere around the globe. And we can exchange that information very quickly in real time. Not only that, because sometimes people have different working weeks. So some people's working week goes from Sunday to Thursday, while other people's working week goes from Monday to Friday. So we've also got to be alert that people's working practices might change, not also what hour it is of the day. I mean, in the um, Dubai at the moment, I think it's 20 past. 12 in the afternoon, but if I was in maybe Australia, it would be 20 past 6 at night. So, you know, that, that can have also make a uh, complexity. I mean, we might have to think about talking with our suppliers, also talking with our customers, what time zone they're on, what their working week is. So, yes, information technologies can be good, but we've got to understand what are the limitations that we're working at. I talked about total quality, at total quality management, making sure that we produce it right the first time. This has got several benefits. One, because the customer always wants good quality, but also it means that we're not making scrap. We're not making waste. One of my friends says, if total quality management ever got to the game of golf, it would be the most boring game in the world. He said, you'd hit a hole in one every time. That would be the total quality management idea of golf, making sure that you can't miss, but it would be boring then, wouldn't it? And we also talk about lean concepts. So then again, that's that idea of minimizing waste, all the forms of waste. So yes, making scrap is a form of waste. And so this is where we talk about uh, things like the Toyota production system. And that's very much geared to that idea of making sure there's no waste. And we inventory in some ways, is a form of waste. Inventory not in motion is a form of waste. And that's what supply chain is about. How do we reduce that level of inventory throughout the supply chain? 
And so people say, and this is one of the, the, the things that some people don't understand. They say, oh, people run out of stock. You should have kept more. No, you don't keep more. You keep your supply chain more agile, more resilient, so that we can, when we do run out of stock, we replace it very quickly. Maybe that day or the, or the next day. So again, highly agile and lean. Information technologies. So again, information technology is getting faster. I mean, I've got a mobile phone. I can do more in this mobile phone than I would have been able to on my old desktop 30 years ago. That was an old, um, I think it was a 386, 20 megabyte RAM. Two megabyte, hard, um, two, not two megabyte RAM, 20 megabyte hard drive. I thought, I'll never fill up that. But I mean, <laughs> hardly anything. You'll get files bigger than that these days. But yes, information technology is moving on a pace. And it's, it's now it's even wearable. I've got the old Apple Watch and, you know, amazing things you can do on that. So information technologies are really moving ahead quickly. And as I said, the internet connected 24-7. Some people think it's too much. You know, you wake up in the middle of the night and some people, you know, just will get on the internet at the middle of the night. But it does. We need that if we're in that global environment. Because as I said, we're all in different time zones. And some organizations will have special teams who, you know, that's their working time is when maybe their suppliers or their customers are awake in different parts of the world. And that leads to that idea of we can have real-time linkages with our best partners, with our best trading partners. And again, we want that idea of highly agile. So when things do change, we don't want to be fixed in to a, maybe a long production run where we have to wait ages before we can change over. We want to be able to chop and change with every single item. And this is where we get down to this idea of a lot size of one, make daily, sell daily. And again, you'll find that through a lot of the um, Toyota production network material thinking at lot size of one, because that's lean. But again, you know, they've got to make it sure that how do we get down to that? How do we configure maybe our operations so that we can make a lot size of one? I remember seeing uh, a, a program about TV program about the cars and they were showing you how they'd configured the paint shop so that every single car going through that paint shop could be a different color and there was no um, contamination with the cars either before or after it was perfectly flawlessly done a lot size of one and yes using internet tools and the end again the internet tools are becoming smarter um, if we think about the idea of artificial intelligence. What opportunity is that going to bring for us? Again, we need to find just channel service provider. And if you look at some of the work uh, that Alibaba is doing, I think you know they've been doing some good things there. And so you can say, which, um, for example, logistics provider do you want to have? And so we'll give you various options to meet your customer requirements. So let's talk about the dreaded COVID-19 coronavirus. And you know, six months ago, we didn't think it was get, uh, six months ago, when was that? That was back in November, wasn't it? I don't think any of us have heard of it back then. And so what we've had is, we've had a lockdown in many countries. So basically, they've said to everyone, Stay at home, don't go out, except for emergency, um, urgent things such as shopping, going to the doctor, and if you have to work, so for example, if you're in the medical profession or if you're in supply chains, you have to work. But everyone else, stay home. If you can work from home, stay home. There's a government response to this emergency. Governments have suddenly had to find to understand that supply chains for things like personal protective equipment are incredibly important. And so they've been looking around, how can they source enough of this protective equipment for their need? 
And so they've been sending planes to other countries, you know, to pick up these all of the, this protective, uh, um, personal protective equipment. But they've also been saying, well, how can we configure internally our own companies? How can we make them maybe start to supply some of those things? And so, in fact, in the village where I am, one of the um, a company that was, was making packaging equipment has now reconfigured themselves for making personal protective equipment because there is demand there, much more demand than there is for the um, food packaging at the moment. I also talked about consumer behavior. Yes, you know, consumer behavior has changed an awful lot. Uh, we are buying probably as much, but maybe even a little bit more food through the supermarkets than we were before. I talked about those initial runs, that panic buying, the hoarding that there was on some, um, some strange items. Well, I, I suppose they are strange because it was ones that weren't, um, ones that wouldn't go off, non-perishable things like toilet paper, flour, pasta, um, yeast, dried yeast, those sorts of things, tin food. People thought, I'll buy that in in case I can't get out, and that way I'm stocked up for any sort of disaster. I don't know whether they were thinking there were going to be zombies coming along too, but that's the sort of thing, thing that's happening in zombie movies. So people were stocking up on things. I'll oh, stock up on those things, because I don't know when I'll be able to get to it. And so people thought, oh, no, the shops are out. But they were back in stock that night, and then people would go out and do the same thing again. And some stores had to put in some rationing to say, we'll make, you know, we can l reach a level of demand, but the way you're at is in advance, but we'll keep going. And within about a week, the situation had got back to normal. So consumer behavior is very important. And in fact, um, some of the online shopping platforms, you know, have ver noticed very little um, reduction in sales. Uh, the food supermarkets are saying, actually, it's been as good as Christmas for them. They're, they've been having a boom time. So for, because of that consumer behavior, some companies will find their demand has gone right down to zero. Others will say it's actually at an elevated position and maybe we'll go even higher. So what are the emerging threats and opportunities? Uh, I suppose the emerging threats are the lockdown and this idea of social distancing. How long will that continue? because that will have an enormous impact on some industries, such as tourism um, and hospitality industries. Uh, some places are opening pubs. Some people are saying, actually, we want to make it so people can go out to eat, but do it safely. So I saw a restaurant, I think it was over in Holland, they built like little greenhouses for each individual table so people can have that, still be social distance while eating out. So, you know, there's a threat there, but it's also an opportunity. So you've got to look and think, what is our demand? How can we reconfigure ourselves to meet that new demand? But also, are there other demands that are going, we're going to lose? And so these are important questions that supply chain managers, as well as the rest of the organization, need to be thinking about. What does our demand look like? But also, what's on the supply side? How is that going out as well? I mean, I, I look at um, the air traffic. There's apps you can get on your phone to look at air traffic. And, you know, there's been a huge drop off. But part of the drop off means that there's less planes flying around. So there's less, possibly less air freight capacity. So you might want to think about that as well. And so, yes, there are threats, but there are also opportunities. And we need to understand all of those. So what do supply chain managements do? So they look at how to get the resources and supporting the services to meet business plans objectives. And I always think, you know, you've got to look at the strategy. Do we understand what our company's strategy is? And I go around from place to place, from businesses, and you know, I talk to people and say, well, what's your strategy? I say, well, you don't really know. But if we don't know our business's strategy, how do we make sure that our supply chain meets that strategy? I mean, strategy should be memorable. I can still remember the Pfizer strategy from 30 years ago. It was a great strategy, 2010-10, which was said by the year 2000, <clears throat> they would have 10 new products, each producing $10 million worth of profit. This is when $10 million was a lot of money. And so, but everyone in the company knew that. And so that's what the company 
what was Focus to do? They knew they had to find those 10 new products by the year 2000 that would produce that money. And so that's the way the whole organization was configured. One, finding new products. And so in pharmaceuticals, there's a, an awful long stage you have to go through to find the new compounds and then find ones that would actually give you a therapeutic good. And then also, not only that, they had to do it in a financially justifiable way because governments don't want to be spending money on new products that don't do anything that no one else does. So, you know, there's that financial imperative. And so that's the way the whole company is doing. And so that's why I'm saying we need to understand the strategy and then we can figure out how does our, how do we marshal our resources to meet that strategy, to meet those objectives. And so this can also be things like designing products and services because it is just services, not just products. And also looking at the processes. So, you know, how best do we mine the thing, the mine those materials? How best do we transport it? How best do we store it? How much do we store? How often do we get shipments in? So, yes, planning and controlling delivery of products at each stage from supplier and, and through to customer. And you might want to look at not all the way back because we're linking, it's a supply chain, all the way back to those primary producers. How often do they get things all the way through to those customers, those consumers who drive that supply chain? You might also be looking at what are the methods and standards that we use, and that's a very important. So you might have, you know, quite complex um, standards that you have to meet. There might be government regulations about standards. We might have our own internal ones, overall policy standards, and they're also looking right down at that detailed, at that granular level at scheduling. When do we have things happen? In which I, um, sequence do we do things? And that can also be an important part. And sometimes the sequence might be change over time as priorities change. So again, that brings that idea, we've got to be agile to be able to do that sequencing effectively. Information management, and there's lots of information out there. Yes, it's all on computers, possibly, but it's also how do we get information into the computer? How do we get information out of the computer? How do we share information? Who do we share information with? Do we share it with suppliers? And that's a good idea. Share it with customers, and that's also a good idea. As well as sharing it around the business so that we can make the correct decisions. So then we might be using that information then for process improvement, this idea of continuous improvement. We want to do things better every day because we need to eliminate gaps and errors, but we also want to improve because, again, if we're in a competitive environment, our competitors will be improving. I'm always minded of um, Alice in Wonderland, that uh, lovely uh, story. And in there, there's a scene where the Red Queen and Alice are running, and they're running, running, running like mad. And they run for a while, and Alice is out of breath. And they stop, and she looks around and says, but well, we haven't got anywhere. And the Red Queen says, well, in this sort of country, that's how fast you have to go just to stay where you are. And that's what business is like. It's a continual race, and you actually have to race to maintain your position. Cost management, and we all said there's always a continual pressure on costs, so we need to manage our costs, don't we? Making sure we're getting things at the right value. But also we make sure that we're looking at the total cost, not um, just costs in isolation. I was working with one company and someone, some clever finance person said, we're going to re remove our, our, we're going to reduce our freight bills. Nothing is going to go by air freight anymore. He thought by doing that, it'll save the company money. It saved the company money on freight, but actually, overall, it ended up costing the company money because they were then paying for more inventory. Because there's a cost in holding inventory. And he didn't realize that by making everything on ships, his inventory would balloon. So then it was a matter of finding that break-even point to say, where's it cheaper to send it by air rather than by sea? And of course, solving problems. We're always going to have problems. Do we actually solve the problem or we just make it better? So it's that idea of continuous improvement. So looking at symptoms and causes, looking at diagnostics, implementing solutions, which will then bring new problems, which again have to be improved.
So what value adding duties are, or activities are performed? Because that's what we said the supply chain does, is adds value to those primary products, their primary produce. If you think about coffee, what happens? They grow the coffee beans. Now, if you know, if we didn't have a supply chain, people just sell coffee beans. You know, you go to the shop and say, I want some coffee, and they give you some coffee beans. I think, that's not good to me. Isn't it much better if we can have that coffee beans processed, dried, crushed, ground, and then made up maybe into instant coffee? So that's much more useful to us, isn't it, than just those raw coffee beans. So this idea, we transform those materials and components into things that are valued by customers, that had utility for the customers. Transport, of course, is another, is another important aspect. I mean, again, I've got some colleagues who say, oh, transport is not important. That's just, that's an add-on. It, it doesn't add value. It does add value. It adds place and time value to the product. Because again, if you're working in a global environment, your markets could be much different in different parts of the world. So if you're in Australia, for example, at the moment, you know, you're not going to be wanting summery things, you're going to be wanting more winter type items. While over here in Europe, maybe you'll have summer type items. So you might have different demands in different parts of the world, and maybe you're in different product lines to meet those. And even in the, the one country, you know, you might find the products that we have here, down here in the southeast on the shelves are different from those that they'll have up in Scotland. We also talk about distribution, that flow of products to customer supply points. And again, people like Amazon are very good at that. I remember reading a wonderful story about Amazon a few years ago in a newspaper. And the headline was, Amazon is going to start sending products to you before you order. And you think, oh no, but what if I don't order? But if you read the story, what would happen is, because Amazon understands us as customers, it's able to place products in a warehouse closer to us so that when we do order, we get a much faster response. So yes, the flow of products to the customer supply points, very important, but you have to understand who your customers are and what their likely demands are going to be and when they're going to be wanting that product. Information, of course, making sure that the right information is fed around the organization and to our partners, both suppliers and customers, and maybe even to the government as well, who also might be a customer. And of course, as we said, we need to reduce all forms of waste because one, that's more profitable, Two, that's good for the environment too. It makes us more sustainable if we're reducing the waste, which might mean maybe we um, manufacture our products so they're easy to recycle or reuse. Or maybe we say, yes, you know, as part of it, like your printer toners, they've got to come back to us to be refilled, refurbished and refilled. And that's part of our supply chain. And they talk about a reverse supply chain, reverse logistics. And in fact, again, governments get in, involved in reverse logistics in terms of people's waste. And so, for example, um, local authorities over in the UK, we collect everyone's waste from their um, curbside every week or two, depending on where you are. And that's then, but then we want to try and sort that to make sure that we can reuse or recycle as much of that waste as possible. In fact, we don't call it waste, we call it a resource. Because we want to try and extract as much value from that. And that's an important part. Strategic planning. I keep on saying we need to understand the strategy. Your organization should have a strategy where it wants to be, maybe five, ten years into the future. And so then we can understand the operations, how it can fit in with that. Where are we going to have our facilities? Looking at marketing, linking customer wants and needs with operations quality. And again, it's understanding our customers. What do they want? What are their needs likely to be out into the future too? So linking the actions and design with our resources, plant and skills, and again, identifying gaps and saying, how do we meet those gaps? Could also be things like, coming on to the next one, human resources, what people are we going to need? And so again, we think about how is technology going to change? 
maybe, you know, are we going to have robots? Maybe we're going to have, you know, these wonderful suits of pe people, so it's part, part human, part robot. That may be an important part of it too. There's always a place for the human being, you know, with that inbuilt knowledge, skills that computers just cannot have. And trying to get the best out of both, as well as purchasing, linking our supplier capabilities. And so this can also be from a strategic one, saying strategically, looking and saying, who should we be purchasing from? Who should we be forming these linkages with? Which suppliers are our key suppliers? And you may even be doing some sort of analysis and saying, who are our A-class suppliers? So we say we might get 80% of the things we buy from maybe 20% of our suppliers. And you say, they're our key suppliers. We need to form strong relationships with them. And it's good for us and it's good for them. And so that will then enhance our core operations. So again, we understand what our core operations parts, and then we get rid of the things that aren't our core operations. Logistics, of course. All of those things, the way we move material, people around the organization to meet our strategic needs. And of course, finance, we've got to do this in a commercial world in a financially viable way. Because if we don't, the company will go broke. And so we need to be able to do that financially viable because that will then also help investors in the organization, maybe borrowing, or do we want actually, you know, the business owners to put money into the business. So we also, the finance is enabling financial information so that people can make the correct sort of um, decisions, maybe regarding costs, maybe regarding, you know, plant upgrades, new plants, and a justification. So strategy, I keep on causing, and I will keep on talking about strategy because it is a key part. And so supply chain managers need to understand what the corporate strategy is so that they can align with it. And quality can be an important part too. I keep on coming back to quality is an important part of supply chain management. In fact, um, this coronavirus has, has highlighted a number of these aspects where people have failed. And so, for example, uh, the UK government sent an airplane over to Turkey to buy some, to get some uh, personal protective equipment. They brought it back and then they found it was poor quality. So that was an enormously wasteful opportunity. So product design, looking at what the customer requirements are, understanding what the requirements are and how can we design a product that meets or maybe even the lights enhances, exceeds the customer requirements, but with a viable cost. And that's an important part. We want a quality that people are willing to pay for. And again, it's understanding what our customers are willing to pay for. So looking at the process, how do we design the processes to use those competencies, what our core competencies are, as well as optimizing the way we use our logistics to move that material and people around to meet our expected customer demand. Facilities, where are we going to put our facilities? And so again, you know, places like Amazon, that's very important. They had to look at where they place their facilities to make sure that they could give that very good customer response to those major population centers, so they can do it same day, same morning, same afternoon. They had to have those uh, facilities sited near those places, and that's what they did. That was their, their strategy, really, during the um, early part of the last decade, was going through an enormous planned expansion, warehouse expansions, so they could do that. Again, looking at our human resources, motivated, skilled, resilient, and customer-focused workforce. So again, training could we meet, meet, have the right people with the right skills. And again, understanding what are the right skills we need. Project management, so again, for example, facilities needs good project management to make sure that we bring in those sites on time and on budget, and up to the quality that we need as well. 
And as we said, supply chain management, having that structured chain of suppliers capable of acting as a single source. So there, often we talk about maybe some organization is really the channel master who very much coordinates all of the activities in that supply chain. So for example, in the car industry, you might find it's one of the big um, car manufacturers and they'll look after even sourcing for their suppliers to making sure they're getting that right product at the right time, right place. Very much acting as one organization. Forecasting. I, uh, people say forecasting. The first rule of forecasting is a forecast will be wrong. But we still need it as a basis for planning because we don't have that. We don't have a basis for planning. We need that forecasting to understand what our future demand will be. Yes, things will change. I mean, so if you were last year, if you were forecasting out this year, you probably didn't forecast having a lockdown or any of those sorts of things. But we still had a level of demand. And for some organizations, that level of demand may be reasonably accurate and maybe even, you know, on the touch on the low side, because as I said, in the um, as we've gone through the lockdown, some people's demand will have gone up, and so they're doing very well. Planning and scheduling. So again, using manufacturing, so things like MRP2, manufacturing resource planning, to try and understand how we get that material through to meet that customer demand. Maybe with long lead times. And so, you know, you might have, if you're buying things, we used to buy cocoa butter from Brazil and that had about a four month lead time. So, you know, that's a very long lead time. And so, yes, managing our processes. So using our core competencies, manage production output and service delivery. So that's an important part, making sure that are we getting, are our plans being achieved? If not, why not? So if you look about it, actually, you know, some people say, oh, supply chain management only started in the last century. Actually, I think it started back in ancient times. If you think about the storage of grain, or processing meats for storage, smoking meats or salting meats, that's really a supply chain um, function because they were trying to say, we want to make sure that we've got continuity of supply to meet all of our demand. We don't just, you know, eat bread part of the year and then starve the rest of the year. No, we want to eat bread the whole year. So we need that grain to be around, that supply of grain to be around the whole year. So I think it really dates back to ancient times. But then as um, information technologies and production technologies really moved faster through to the 70s, so if you think about the Liberty Shipbuilding Program during the Second World War and actually wars, are a really interesting way of looking at supply chains. You know, how, um, com uh, how whole countries uh, restructure themselves to meet that demand. And in fact, if you talk about the coronavirus, that's what a lot of countries have been doing. You know, they've been saying, it's like a war. And so they, they've been sort of marshalling their resources to meet that, if you like, that battle of, of humanity against the coronavirus. You know, that's why I'm saying changing what they were doing to maybe changing to personal protective equipment or whatever they are to meet the new challenges. So yes, optimized production. And then during the 70s to the 90s, you know, um, IT, information technologies, computers started to get more use. That's what I'm saying. I still remember that day vividly in 1984, I believe it was, when they came along and they put a computer on my desk and they said, here, Steve, here's a computer. We're going to have the paperless office. It's not paperless now, but that was their goal back then. And that's what they thought. They thought just by having a computer, we'll go paperless. It didn't, but it was a better way of managing that information. We got away from those manual cards and all, all the, the mathematical errors that were on there. And so now the computers make the mistakes, but they make it faithfully. So I, I hope, you know, and as we got through um, up to the year 2000, you know, computers got smaller, we started having more laptops, and then even onto the good old handheld ones now. But also this idea, of we went to, um, if you like, back in the uh, that early period, 70 to 90, that was sort of MRP2, and then we talked about ERP, Enterprise Requirements Planning, and then post-enterprise, it's still Enterprise Requirements Planning, but it's more, just, it's more than just the enterprise, it's now 
the supply chain management planning. So rather than just focusing on the business, we look at the whole supply chain. So I talked about strategy. So you might say there's an overall corporate strategy. So that Pfizer 1, 20, 10, 10, that's an overall one. And then that would have been broken down into different divisions would have had a strategy. So for example, there would have been a research strategy. How do we find all of these new products? Who are the markets? Who are going to be our customers? And so I was working with one company and said, okay, they're in the um, beverages, so drinks. They said, well, based on demographics, we can see that a lot of the people are moving into the cities. And so we think overall, if we want to develop our business, we need to make sure we've got a key, pro, um, key facility in all the world's top 100 cities. And then you think, well, where are the top 100 cities? Lots of ones in China. I mean, yes, of course, you've got London, Paris, New York, but it's also places in China, places in Nigeria. Good morning to Nigeria and uh, South America. And so these places are becoming key important places in terms of demand. And then, you know, you might look at your marketing strategy. Who are those customers out there? What segments are there in the market? What products and services can we make profitably to meet those segments of the market? You might also be looking at your financial strategy. How are we going to fund business going forward? If we need extra funds, what are we going to do? Do we have to borrow money? Or can we get it from our investors? And also, what is our operational strategy? What are our core competencies again? What processes and services do we want to do versus which ones we'll buy in? And sometimes also not only buy in, maybe we'll sell off some of the things we're doing because we say, actually, that's a really good service. It's not part of our core competency, but we'll maybe hive that off into its own individual company. And quality is another key aspect for there. Might also look at this idea. You don't want the whole market. You just want that key, tiny part of the market that's the profitable part. Looking at what processes we need, what quality, what human capital, so you know, the human resources we need and will need out into the future, what skills will we need? Where are we going to site our, our, like, um, our facilities? So are we going to have one site that has the whole world? Or maybe we'll have key sites, maybe one for North America, South America, one for Europe, the Middle East, and maybe another one for Asia. And also, we, even within those sites, how is material going to flow through that site in a logical way? So that also leads on to things like job design, what are the people going to be doing? What skills and talents do we already have? What new skills and talents do we need to bring in? How do we encourage innovation in the workforce? Look at also how we're interacting with our both customers and with our suppliers. What linkages, how are we going to do that? What are the information needs? Inventory, where are we going to have inventory? Do we have to have some inventory maybe, you know, that will be there for quite a while? I, again, I was working for a fertilizer company and we used to get one item, Christmas Island rock phosphate, and we get used to get full shiploads of it. You wouldn't want to be sending a ship to Christmas Island every day. So we used to get it about twice a year because that was an efficient way of doing it. But again, we had to store it. So again, it's looking at our inventory. How much do we store? How long do we think we're going to be keeping it? And you might also be thinking about what, and that's a way of risk management as well, keeping that inventory. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. 
Again, scheduling, looking at our production scheduling and how can we have maybe scheduling in maintenance of our equipment to make sure that it keeps going effectively. To minimize downtime, but also gives a better quality of product. So opportunities, post-lockdown economies. What is a post-lockdown economy going to be? Is it going to be more shifted from what it was? So are there going to be things like less on that tourism? Um, a lot of the air airlines, you know, they're really um, worrying about this in a big way. They're saying people may be flying less, especially, you know, governments are putting in regulations saying if you fly, when you land, you've got to go spend two weeks in isolation. So they're saying that's going to cover, you know, that's going to cut down possibly a lot of the um, international tourism that used to go on. May even cut down a lot of the international business flights that people were going. And people were maybe looking at things like, we'll use online facilities rather than going there. So yes, there might be also more remote working. Are people going to be working from home? If, you're, if you've got bigger workforce working from home, maybe you don't need quite so much office space as what you had to. Um, as I said, digital delivery. So as they're here, they're, they're a, a key example of how people are saying, what is the new market going to look like? And they're saying online delivery could be a great way forward. And so you've got to think about how do we move our business? How do we restructure our business to take advantage of those new opportunities? We also want resilient supply chains. So as, as I said, you know, ones that can respond to big changes in demand. So it could be a massive increase in the demand. It could be a massive decrease in demand. Life science industry. So, you know, if you're in um, some of those life sciences, such as vaccine manufacture, or if you're doing testing of things like coronavirus, you're saying it's a big increase in our market. And as I said, personal protective equipment, everyone's talking about personal protective equipment these days. So, you know, can we take advantage of that new market? Because we say, that new market is going to go a long time. People are going to be wanting more of this personal protective equipment. So I, I just thought I'd just cover up a little bit on risk because that's an important part, managing the risk, saying things that could impact on the business. So if you were looking at last year, you wouldn't have heard about the coronavirus, but you may have said, there could be a big health issue. If a pandemic does strike, how is the business going to cope with that? So a risk is something that may happen. So there's a man on the tightrope. He may fall off. He may get over fine. When there's a person drowning, they're in trouble. You know, that's, a, that's something that's already happening. That's already impacting. So take a moment to think about your risks. And there's some of the risks you might have. So crisis and continuity management, but it's also some of these other ones. Supply chain continuity, consumer safety is an important one, product quality, ethics. So there's a whole lot of risks, and we need to understand how to use, how to manage those risks. And you might have a risk heat map where you say, what's the likelihood, and what's the impact? And then you can say, give it a risk score, and you might say, okay, based on that risk score, how can we reduce that risk score? What actions can we take? So there's just a bit more about that. So we can either accept the risk and say, okay, we'll accept it. And if it happens, that's it. We can mitigate it. So what are the steps we can make? So, you know, alternate suppliers, safety equipment. So PPE is a form of risk management, isn't it? It's trying to reduce the risk for people of catching the disease. We could transfer the risks, maybe your insurance, so get someone else to bear the risk. Or we could avoid and say, let's just not do that. And we hope our doctors... <laughs> Don't do that. We hope they keep doing and use that PPE to mitigate that risk. So conclusion, unfortunately, some businesses will fail if they fail to adapt. Others will find demand has increased. Others will say, actually, there's new opportunities here. We will take steps. And so risk management is an important feature in identifying those risks and in identifying and responding to them. So quickly, he says, are there any questions? Thank you for your time today. I hope you found it useful. And I hope you find, look at the other Aztec 
um, courses. And again, because there's a wealth of opportunity out there. So thank you for coming along today. Thank you very much for your comments. It's been my pleasure. And stay safe. Stay well. Oh, that's a good one. Um, supply chain management and materials management. Materials management is part of supply chain management. All right, I've got a question there. What's the difference between project management and material management? Materials management could be a subset of project management. So a project is a specific endeavor. So maybe building a sports center. And so we have to say, we need to have materials management. We need to make sure that we get the right materials at the right time as we're building that center. But really materials management is to support other operations. So it could be to support project management, it could be to support just ongoing manufacturing management. Actually, you sort of need materials management in your house when you're shopping. That's materials management. Every week, we're going through materials management. What do I need this week? Do I need toilet paper? Do I need flour, milk, spices, meats, etc.? You know, what um, vegetables, rice, that's materials management. Project management is saying, here's something we're going to do, how much and then how long will it take us to do this specific endeavor?
Just had a question. Is it the case that customers dictate the pace when it comes to supply chain management? I'd say in the majority of the time, yes, globally. But I, I suppose one thing you might say, if you're looking at a specific um, plant, it might say it has to rate, it has to run at a set rate. But overall, globally, it should be that rate is set by the pace of demand. Because otherwise, if you're making more than what the um, customer demand is, you're going to be building up inventory. And if you're making less than the rate of customer demand, then you're going to have some unmet demand. And com some companies will say, that's all right. We don't mind if there's some unmet demand. In fact, some companies like unmet demand because it increases, they can charge then a premium for their product. But on the whole, usually we want to make sure that we're meeting customer demands. I suppose part of it is, say, you know, what is the cost of a missed order? Yes, that's right. Total quality management is part of it. We need um, quality management as part of supply chain management. Thank you for that comment. I just got a question there from Hassan about how long do we have to keep our supply chain management under close follow-up? I say always. I mean, I, I think that's the whole point. I think people now are saying it's important. We should be keeping more of a close eye on it all the time, not just some of the time. I think, you know, people are now going to say, oh, we didn't realize how important it is. And so, yes, it, it, it will. I can't see how it's not going to still be important.
Uh, that's a very good question about how the airlines and hospitality industries, how can they optimize their supply chain management? Um, I suppose they've got to reconfigure themselves. Um, I suppose the airlines will very much have to downsize their capacity. They've probably got an awful lot of excess capacity that they just won't need for a considerable length of time, particularly if we have you know, um, the um, quarantine restrictions when people land. So, you know, people won't be flying as much. There will probably still be some people flying. I was listening on the radio this morning about um, a golfer. He's saying, yes, you know, they will maybe only travel once or twice a year. So, you know, they'll go from Europe over to the US. They'll have to go quarantine and they'll stay in the US for some months and then come back. Whereas than before, they used to flip back and forth. So, yes, they will still be traveling a bit, but it won't be as much. And so their supply chains now have got to very much constrict. Hospitality, they may look at um, reconfiguring themselves to say, OK, maybe the tourism industry. So, for example, where they were concentrating on overseas tourists, maybe now they more look at the domestic tourism market. So there may still be opportunities in there for them. Um, so looking at, at that demand side, so once you've got your demand understood, then you can configure your resources to meet that level of demand. But that the first stage is always understanding the demand.